Hello and uh, good morning everyone. I hope all of you are doing fine. Uh, so today too we have uh, only a recorded session so I must apologize for that. I was hoping to meet you uh, for a live session at least uh, today but unfortunately I am on leave. So uh, we only have a recorded uh, session for this class as well. Hope you won't mind. Um, so uh, we had finished uh, discussing the Kashmir singing girl, you know, the goldsmith and the Kashmir singing girl in the last class. Uh, you know, I hope all of you haven't forgotten about that assignment that I gave you uh, in that last lecture. I have gotten only a couple of assignments so far. So uh, do work on that and uh, send it to me as soon as you can. Now, uh, this new story that we are going to begin discussing today is called Rip Van Winkle. It is by an, an American short story writer called uh, Washington Irving. Now this story uh, is something that uh, most of you might might be familiar with. At least the name Rip Van Winkle might be familiar to you because this is a story which has been uh, adapted a lot uh, into children's uh, literature or you know even as cartoons and uh, various kinds of comics. Uh, so you probably know this uh, story already. Uh, so this is one of the, uh, you know, one of the iconic stories of American uh, literature. You know, America is not really known for, uh, you know, a very vibrant literary tradition because, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, it started off as a colony of Britain and, uh, you know, Throughout most of its early history as a country, uh, America did not have uh, much of a great literary tradition, especially, you know, not a, a, a short story tradition. So Washington Irving was one of the early pioneers who contributed to this, uh, you know, this genre, the, the genre of the American short story. And this is one of his iconic uh, works. Uh, there is one more work that he is really famous for that is called uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow which is also something which is probably familiar to you because it has also been adapted into a lot of children's uh, you know, literature and also horror stories because that is the, the source of the story of the headless horseman you know, uh, apparently which is you know a rather famous Halloween story. Right? Um, so uh, let us quickly take a look at uh, Washington Irving's uh, life. So let me just pull up his Wikipedia page. So uh, basically he lived during the uh, 19th century. He was born in 1783 and uh, he, he died in 1859. So he was famous as a short story writer, an essayist, biographer, historian, and diplomat of the early 19th century. Uh, he is best known for his short stories, Rip Van Winkle. So this particular story, it was written in 1819 and uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which I just mentioned. And uh, both of these appear in a book. Uh, the title of that book is The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon Gentleman. So apart from this, he was also a historical uh, writer. He wrote historical biographies of Oliver Goldsmith, Muhammad, uh, George Washington, as well as several histories of the 15th century Spain that uh, deal with subjects such as Alhambra, uh, Christopher Columbus and the Moors. Um, Irving served as American ambassador to Spain. Okay, so these details are not very important. Let us look at his works. So going to that third paragraph there on the screen, Irving was one of the first American writers to earn acclaim in Europe and he encouraged other American authors such as Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Herman Melville and Edgar Allan Poe. He was also admired by some British writers including Byron, Campbell, Charles Dickens, Mary Shelley, Francis Jeffrey and Walter Scott. So really, you know, he was a part of that whole, uh, you know, uh, early 19th century uh, literary movement, both in America as well as in England. So uh, 
um, you know that that is a time of uh, romanticism as a movement, and uh, we can definitely read some you know romantic uh, characteristics in his stories as well, okay. especially in how he describes nature, because you know nature was a huge part of uh, the romantic vision, and also about you know what man's place within nature is, right? So sort of. Uh, similar to the kind of themes that you find in Wordsworth and Coleridge's poetry, right? About locating man and nature within the same continuum. All right, so that is about um, Washington Irving. You can see a picture of him there. Now, moving on to the story, uh, let me just uh, try to summarize the story very quickly first, and then we will move on to the actual text of the story. The story is rather simple. Uh, it is about a man called Rip Van Winkle uh, and uh, he lives in a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, rural, uh, peaceful village uh, and uh, uh, life is really easy for him uh, except for the fact that uh, he doesn't really get on with his wife. His wife is sort of like, a, you know, a nagging wife. Um, always uh, you know scolding him for being lazy scolding him for whiling away his time uh, playing with his uh, you know with his fellows or, or uh, you know generally wasting time in all kinds of useless activities and uh, you know even though he is uh, constantly scolded by his wife uh, he uh, tries to escape from her by often going into the woods for hunting so he has a dog, a pet dog. So he takes this dog and usually he goes to the mountains to find some, you know, peace and quiet. Okay. So one day he does this. He takes his gun, his dog, and he walks into the mountains. And uh, there he met, meets a few strange, uh, you know, people. And uh, they are engaged in a sort of, a, you know, some sort of a bowling game. Uh, like American uh, bowling, you might have seen bowling alleys when where you you know you set up a few wooden pins and you knock them down with a ball. So this is a kind of an early form of that game that they are playing. And uh, uh, he approaches them and uh, he sort of helps them uh, carry some of the things that they are carrying or something. You know he gently helps them and they offer him a drink. So after he drinks this. Uh, he feels very drowsy and he lies down at the at the foot of a tree and falls asleep. Now when he wakes up, the strange people are gone. His dog is gone. Uh, and, um, you know, he finds that his uh, gun, which he had, you know, set there uh, leaning against the tree, that is still there. But the gun's, gun looks strangely rusted, right? And then when he feels his face, he finds that he has a long, an extremely long beard. Okay. But still he doesn't realize what has happened. So he goes, you know, he takes his gun, he calls for his dog and he goes back to the village. And when he reaches the village, he finds that, uh, you know, he cannot really recognize uh, the place. The place has changed. There are new buildings. Uh, none of the people look familiar. Uh, and, uh, you know, even the, the flag, uh, which used to be flying uh, on one of the taverns, uh, you know, even that has changed. Earlier it was the British flag and now it is, a, it is some other flag, right? So uh, he doesn't you know, immediately realize what has happened. But after talking uh, to a few people, he gradually understands that uh, he did not just sleep for a few hours. He was in fact sleeping for many many years okay so due to some sort of a, a, a magical spell uh, this poor man he slept for you know 10 or 15 years he fell asleep for such a long time and uh, uh, he slowly he looks for his relatives and he finds that you know his wife has died and uh, his son and his daughter are still living and his son has the same name as himself. So he is now called Ripman Winkle. Uh, but, you know, 
even though such a traumatic change has occurred in his life he finds that it is really easy for him to reintegrate himself back into uh, social life because coming back after so many years he is now a really respected member of the society and uh, everyone holds him in high regard everyone everyone wants to hear his strange strange story and you know even the children uh, whom he used to love playing with earlier you know they are even more adoring of him now that you know he has this strange sto story to tell and finally he even has all the time that he uh, ever wanted because you know his wife is no longer around to nag him so uh, it turns out to be a kind of a positive story uh, at the end but uh, what really attracts uh, us as readers of literature to the story is uh, first of all you know the kind of uh, interweaving of this uh, magical realism into uh, you know into such an early story because you know this was the time when people used to write uh, you know uh, realist fiction people used to write about uh, you know uh, everyday occurrences things that are plainly explainable not miraculous or you know things like uh, magic uh, so this kind of a, uh, a technique which washington irving has used uh, by incorporating certain supernatural or magical elements in the story that is really interesting secondly what interests us is uh, the contrast between then and now right so uh, we have a situation here when the same character experiences two extremely different time periods one was when he was you know a, a young man and then later on after many many years so it, we are invited to look at what has remained constant and what has changed among the things that remain constant uh, are nature right so the trees the mountains the rivers all those things have cha have not changed at all you know they have remained stable uh, they form a sort of a you know a very familiar backdrop that washington uh, i mean uh, rip and winkle can easily identify even after waking up after so so many years right that has not changed then when when he comes to the village even though the people are different the lineages the you know the the kind of lives they lead are also remarkably the same right so you have the same character types being repeated for example uh, you know ripman winkle's son is exactly the kind of person that ripman winkle used to be so there is this sort of recurrence of um, what do you say character types even after uh, such a long period of time so time seems to not have you know a much uh, a great effect on the continuance of these kinds of um, you know personality traits there will always be uh, a ripman winkle there will always be uh, a school teacher there will always be a bartender you know like this you know we 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 are led to believe in the intergenerational continuance of certain uh, character types then about what has changed uh, we see that the changes are really trivial you know even though we might be led to believe that they are phenomenal for example uh, the whole political setup has changed when rip van winkle went to sleep america was still a british colony but he wakes up after the american war of independence and now america is a, a, a you know a different country right it is no longer ruled by britain but this kind of change even though it is a phenomenal change it does not really have an impact on the life of rip van winkle right he continues to live as he ever uh, lived uh, nothing seems to uh, you know seems to have substantially changed in uh, you know in his ambition in his character in his interaction with others so uh, uh washington irving may may be trying to tell us that you know look at look at what is constant look at what is the bedrock of society it is not politics it is not uh you know it is not uh you know great social uh, changes or uh, you know 
what great politicians do or what wars can do you know uh, an entire independence war has has been fought while you know washington uh, sorry van wickel was asleep but it strangely doesn't seem to have any great lasting effect village life is still village life right so that sort of a uh, element is also something which is really interesting in this story so um now coming to the story itself unlike the other couple of stories that we have read this is a rather long story uh, so it might take us a while if we uh, read through it gradually so but i do want to read it uh, you know as much as possible because uh, i have a terrible memory and i don't really remember all of the uh, of the interesting points that are there in the story when you know i read it uh, the last time so i too need to kind of you know refresh my memory of the story in order to uh, you know uh, rediscover what is so interesting about it so i do want to go into the story as much as possible so at least for today uh, let us try to uh, read the first part of the story maybe a couple of pages and then uh, you know after all of you have maybe you know read the story completely we might be able to skip ahead a little bit and uh, do a kind of a thematic discussion we might just pick out some themes from the story and uh, discuss them okay so let us uh, go to the story now okay so uh, so this is the story um let me read the first uh, the first uh, preface of the story because uh, this story has a sort of a uh, initial part which is uh, you know which is a preface it is an introduction to how the story was written and supposedly uh, this story is um, you know a posthumous writing it is a discovered writing and this has been written by a fictional character called Daedric Knickerbocker so Daedric Knickerbocker is a character invented by uh, Washington Irving and uh, uh, like his name suggests he you know he is a dutch person right uh, uh, the the name rip van winkle is also dutch in origin okay so nickerbocker is a person who collects uh, stories of dutch immigrants basically you should remember that america at this time was uh, you know an immigrant nation nation it did not have any uh, you know any real uh, native history any longer because the red indians were all um, you know they were their land was seized by uh, colonists from europe and uh, basically uh, various parts of america was settled by people from various parts of europe and the the area around new york what is now the present uh, city of new york that was uh, you know settled by people from holland you know dutch people who came from holland and they when they came to america they brought over their own customs their own folk tales their histories you know their icons and uh generally you know th there was a cultural transfer from um from holland to england uh, sorry to america and uh, diedrich nickerbocker is a fictional character invented by washington irving uh to chart this dutch ancestry this dutch culture which was transferred from uh, europe to america so uh, this story is supposedly the you know collected by diedrich nickerbocker okay so that is why this preface is trying to tell us what uh, diedrich nickerbocker did uh, what was his occupation what was his uh, you know ambition uh, and uh, generally about what uh, you know or why he collected the story okay. so the following tale was found among the papers of the late diedrich nickerbocker an old gentleman of new york who was very curious in the dutch history of the province and the manners of the descendants from its primitive settlers his historical researches however did not lie so much among books as among men 
for the former are lamentably scanty on his favorite topics, whereas he found the old burghers and still more their wives rich in that legendary lore so invaluable to true history. So basically, he was a, a sort of an anthropologist. Okay, so Dietrich Nikabokam was, uh, you know, if he lived during our time, he would have been called an anthropologist. He used to go and uh, uh, talk to these old, uh, you know, settlers who came from Holland, and um, he used to collect the kind of oral narratives that they had to offer, right? The kind of legends, the kind of myths the kind of stories and experiences that they uh, brought over with them. And that was what really interested him. So these old settlers and their wives, both, you know, uh, they were all excellent sources of material for Tirik Mikaboka. Whenever, therefore, he happened upon a genuine Dutch family, snugly shut up in its low-roofed farmhouse under a spreading sycamore, he looked upon it as a little clasped volume of black letter and studied it with the zeal of a bookworm. Okay. So every family that he visited was a book to him. You know, it was like a little clasped volume of black letter. Black letter refers to the kind of type that was used in books during that time. Books during that time were printed in this closely uh, printed uh, you know, typography, you know, typeface called black letter. And, uh, you know, that way you could pack a lot of information into one single page. Okay. So every family that he visited was like a book for him. Okay. The result of all these researches was a history of the province during the reign of the Dutch governors, which he published some years since. There have been various opinions as to the literary character of his work, and to tell the truth, it is not a bit better than it should be. So, you know, this is a kind of a self-deprecating uh, statement that Washington Irving is probably saying. He says that there is not much literary merit in what Dietrich Nikabokov has written. Okay. So we should remember that he himself is inventing Dietrich Nikabokov and all the stories that he writes. So this is sort of like bashfulness on the part of the author that what he writes is probably not literary enough, but it is interesting from a historical point of view. Okay. Its chief merit is its scrupulous accuracy, which indeed was a little questioned, was little was a little questioned on its first appearance, but has since been completely established. And it is it is now admitted into all historical collections as a book of undisputable authority. So initially, when this, this book by Dietrich Nickerbocker supposedly came out, um, it was not viewed as accurate. Okay, it was questioned. But later on, it gained acceptability and now it is treated as true history. So that is also an interesting statement because, you know, uh, how can something which is not true at a particular time later become true? Is truth something which is pliable is truth something which gradually evolves and reveals itself but this is all this is a question that you know we can discuss at some other time maybe because it is an interesting question but here uh, we are told that Diedrich Nikabokar's stories were first thought to be a little untrue but later on they were accepted to be extremely authentic okay Okay, the old gentleman died shortly after the publication of his work and now that he is dead and gone, it cannot do much harm to his memory to say that his time might have been much better employed in weightier labours. Okay, so again, the author is sort of mocking fun of uh, you know his own character. And he says that it might have been better if Dietrich Nickerbocker did something else because on the whole, you know, what he did doesn't really amount to much. He, however, was apt to ride his hobby in his own way, and though it did now and then kick up the dust a little in the eyes of his neighbours and grieve the spirit of some friends for whom he felt the truest deference and affection, 
Yet his errors and follies are remembered more in sorrow than in anger, and it begins to be suspected that he never intended to injure or offend. Okay. So this is how his memory has been preserved by uh, you know those that knew him. Okay. So he is generally remembered as somebody who just wanted to do this as a hobby. Okay. He was merely riding his hobby horse. You know, to ride your hobby horse is a you know, it's, it's an idiom in English. And uh, that is just what Diedrich Knickerbocker did. You know, he just collected these stories as a hobby. And even though sometimes it might be, in, you know, inaccurate, sometimes it might be not completely true, he was, you know, his intentions were pure. Right? He never did, you know, he never intended to injure anybody or offend anyone. But however his memory may be appreciated by critics, it is still held dear among many folk whose good opinion is well worth having, particularly certain biscuit bakers who have gone so far as to imprint his likeness on their New Year, New Year cakes and have thus given him a chance for immortality almost equal to being stamped on a Waterloo medal or a Queen Anne's farthing. Okay. So again, uh, this is a kind of uh, humorous uh, self-deprecating writing that Washington Irving is saying and uh, he says that uh, certain biscuit bakers, certain bakers in New York, they have sort of uh, appropriated his stories and uh, they now print his face on the kind of cookies they make, not cookies, the cakes that they bake. So having your face printed on a cake is something which is trivial, you know, it is something which is almost laughably unimportant. And yet, uh, you know, Washington Irving is telling us that, you know, this is equivalent to having your uh, face stamped on a coin or, you know, stamped on a, a, a war medal. You know, those are things which are much more serious, which are much more important. But yet, both are being equated and basically, uh, Washington Irving is just poking fun of his own character. So, um, having said this, we are now given this story uh, called Rip Van Winkle. And uh, what, what effect does this preface have on us? After reading this preface, we are entirely sure that the story that we are going to read is also fictional. right? There are not going to be much uh, you know, realistic or true to life events that are going to happen in the story. And, uh, you know, the setting of the story is also clear. This is obviously something to do with uh, Dutch culture, Dutch settlers in New York. And uh, it is also uh, going to be told in a rather humorous way because it is written by, uh, you know, this fictional character called Diedrich Nickerbocker. So having said this, uh, we now go into the story. So let me just uh, pause for a bit, one second. Okay, uh, since I think uh, we have really exceeded uh, 30 minutes now, I'm not sure how long this recording has been uh, running for. Uh, but I think we'll, you know, we'll finish with this little, uh, you know, little, uh, prefatory poem or uh, a little excerpt from a poem which is given as a preface to the story. So it begins by saying, By Woden, God of Saxons, from whence come Wednesday, that is Woden's day, truth is a thing that ever I'll keep unto this day in which I creep into my sepulchre. Cartwright. So basically, you know, this is a statement which ensures the truthfulness of the story. So this is written by Diedrich Knickerbocker and he says, I believe in the importance of truth. I will hold on to truth. It is a thing that I will ever keep, ever I will keep until the day in which I creep into my sepulchre. Sepulchre means grave. Okay. So until the day I die, I shall be truthful. Basically that is what uh, Diedrich Knickerbocker is declaring. So again, let us compare this statement with what uh, he is actually going to tell us in the story that is coming next. 
and we you know we can be the judges of whether um, Dietrich Nikabaka is really being truthful or not. So we'll stop there for the day and uh, during the next class uh, you know hopefully it will be a live session as I said uh, we will read the story. Okay. So you can go ahead and read the story on your own uh, and uh, we'll read the important points of the story probably in the next class. Okay then, bye.